This morning, uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, and, and uh, particularly verses 8 to 10. Uh, this is the uh, sort of the end of this section that was begun way back in chapter 1, where Paul has been talking about our great salvation in Christ and unpacking it. And um, the theme is going to change a little bit uh, after this. Uh, at least it's going to change a little bit in the second half of, uh, of chapter 2. <clears throat> so these are important verses and very familiar ones uh, that we're going to look at this morning. I'll begin by reading verse 8 and read to verse 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your, your own doing. For it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Lord, we pray that you would open up this your word to our hearts, that we would see it clearly, that we would see our need, that we would see Christ as meeting our need, and that we would respond in faith and in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul continues to expound the, this great salvation that is ours uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is caught up in the thought of it. He is caught up in the glory of it. He seems to go from one idea, one theme to another. Every theme, every idea continues to, uh, continues to wrap his emotions and his feelings. And, and here he comes to this great idea of this idea of grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And there are actually three key words that I want to focus in on on these three verses this morning. And the first key word will be that key word grace. Uh, and we'll see that salvation is by grace. The second key word will be faith. And we'll see that salvation is through faith. And the third word is works. And we will see that salvation results in good works. So that's where we're headed uh, this morning. By grace, you have been saved uh, through faith. Um, what is grace exactly? Um, people have tried to define it over the years. Theologians have wrestled with understandings and definitions. What is interesting to note is that when grace is talked about in the Bible, it, it, there, there's actually two parts to it. The one part is God's attitude towards us. He has a gracious attitude towards us sinners. But the second part it is, is God's action towards us. In other words, God acts graciously towards us. Remember, it is by grace you have been saved. So grace, God's grace, has some power to it. And that has been the theme for some time here in Ephesians, ever since he was brought this up back in, in chapter 1, that it is God's power that has saved us and that has brought us, uh, brought us life and brought us uh, out, of, out of death and given us new life and raised us with him on heavenly places. All of this is by the grace, the power, the gracious power of God. So it's interesting to keep that idea in mind that grace has to do with God's attitude but also with his action toward us. <laughs> Now, some people like to, when I was growing up, they used to, I used to hear this a lot, that grace is unmerited favor, right? Grace is God's favor towards us, even though we don't deserve it. And that's true enough. It's actually a fairly good definition of what grace is, unmerited favor, the unmerited favor of God. But I have a tendency to think that the definition doesn't go quite far enough. Grace isn't just God giving us something we don't deserve, Grace is God giving us the opposite of what we deserve. Um, what do we deserve? Well, earlier on we were told in verse 3 that we were by nature children of wrath. So we deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the just and righteous judgment of God. But that's not what we get when we put our, our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. What we do not get is wrath. Instead, what we get is what? We we get to be co-heirs with Christ of all things. We get to be seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You can't get more extreme than that. You go one day being the object of God's wrath, you, the very next day then you become the object of his affections, of his love, and of all gifts that he wants to give. You become a child, as it were, of the kingdom, a child of God. 
That's grace. The thing that takes you from the lowest place to the highest place is the, is the action of God in sending Christ Jesus, and it is the attitude of God in that he loves us and cares for us deeply. Paul is overwhelmed with grace. In fact, we've seen it throughout this early part of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he blessed us in the beloved. Verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. In chapter 2, verse 5, uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive with Christ. With, with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. It's almost like he's, he's caught up in this idea, we've been made alive with, in Christ. How did that happen? And then he thinks, oh, it's by grace that this happened, he says in verse 5. And then he repeats it again in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. And in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. You see, Paul is overwhelmed with this idea. He's caught up with the idea that God is a gracious God. Perhaps the, you can't think about this verse without thinking about the song Amazing Grace. It seems like everybody knows the song. It is the most famous song in the world, and it is an old song. It was written back in the 1700s by uh, John Newton, and uh, I've seen it, heard it everywhere. You know, you, you can't there, you can't watch a dramatic death scene in a movie without somebody coming out and playing Amazing Grace, uh, you, you know, with the bagpipes. It's just, it's become so part of our culture and our tradition, our tradition. You don't often hear people singing it in those dramatic moments, but it, when you do hear them singing it, you're struck by the very first, uh, the very first line. Um, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And a lot of people are offended by the language. You mean, what do you mean I'm a wretch? Uh, that's not a very good word to call somebody. But John Newton, when he wrote that, was very, very intentional. He understood himself as a wretch in need of grace. Newton was born in 1725, and his mother was a godly woman. He was a Christian woman, but unfortunately, and she taught him the scriptures, by the way, but unfortunately, she died when Newton was seven years old. And subsequently, Newton be, began, was raised by his father. Well, his father was a sailor who was gone a lot of times, and when he wasn't gone, it, he would take John Newton with him. In fact, Newton went on his first sailing venture when he was 11 years old. And he began his career in, in the shipping industry at, the, at, at that very young age. He eventually uh, continued to do that for a number of years. But he was a rebellious, sinful, vile, wretched person before God by his own admission. In fact, listen to an article, a paragraph from an article of Christianity Today about the life of John Newton. It says this, Newton lost, he's talking about Newton as a young man, Newton lost his first job in a merchant's office because of an unsettled behavior and an impatience of restraint. In other words, he was pretty bad. A pattern that would persist for years. He spent his later teen years at sea before he was press ganged aboard the HMS Harwich in 1744. The Harwich was a, a famous uh, uh, British naval ship. Newton rebelled against the discipline of the Royal Navy and deserted. He was caught, put in irons, and flogged. He eventually convinced his superiors to discharge him to a slaver ship espousing free-thinking principles, he remained arrogant and insubordinate, and he lived with moral abandon. I sinned with a high hand, he later wrote, and I made it my study to tempt and seduce others. You know, it's one thing to live a wild lifestyle. It's another thing to draw others into that lifestyle, and that was how he characterized his young years. It even got worse as Newton got older because later he became involved in the slave trade as a sailor. And then when he retired from sailing for, for health reasons, he became an investor. He eventually owned a slave ship and was responsible for a lot of the harsh treatment 
that the slaves would receive. He would, in his old age, he would finally call himself the old African blasphemer because he could never get away from his past life and the past, well, he, he got away from it because he became a radically different person, but he, but he never left the thought that once he was a sinner, once he was a wretch, and he needed God's grace. You see, the point is that until we see the depth of our sin, we will never understand our need of grace. Until we see that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, until we see that we are enslaved to this thing, the things of this world, remember Paul's talked about this, until we see that we are under the wrath of God, we will never understand the full extent of God's grace because God's grace reaches as low as we can possibly get in our understanding. And it not only reaches down to us, but it reaches and lifts us up to the very throne room of God because of grace. Newton said this, the happiest later in his life, the happiest Christians, they are the happiest Christians who have the lowest thoughts of themselves and in whose eyes Jesus is most glorious and precious. And that was John Newton. He had the lowest sense of himself of a wretch, but he saw himself as a wretch that was saved by the grace of God, God's amazing grace. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The second word in our text, the key word, is faith. And what we learn about faith is that salvation comes through the instrument of faith. Now, these are very famous words. If you ever went through a Bible memorization plan, uh, I am almost guaranteed that somewhere in your, uh, somewhere in your car, your memory cards, or somewhere in, in the list of verses you had to remember, you probably had to remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. They're very similar to the other verse you had to remember, probably the first verse they made you remember, which is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The key in there is that God has done something. He has given us his Son. The key in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is that God's grace is a gift. He has given us something. In order to receive, in order to appropriate that gift, we have to receive it. How does a person get a gift? A gift must be received in order to be enjoyed, in order to be experienced. So how does one receive the gift of God's grace? How does one receive the gift of of eternal life and the answer in our text is they re that it is received by faith by grace you have been saved through faith now what does it mean to have faith well um, if you look at it in the Greek the, the Greek word faith is simply another word for believe uh, the verbal form, typically in English, when you translate the word, you, in, in the verbal form, you translate it uh, as, as believe. Uh, in, the, in the noun form, you translate it as faith. Uh, but I like the word, I like the word, the believe kind of gives us the idea that faith is always in your head. It's not in anything else about you. So I like the word trust to characterize what it means to have faith. What do you trust? In whom do you trust in? In whom do you look to when life gets difficult or hard or bad or when you face the valley of the shadow of death? You know, that's the real test. The real test is, is when you're on your deathbed, where are your thoughts? Who are you looking to for help? Who are you, who are you what are you trying to, what are you trying to find your strength from, your, your hope from? When there are lots of things people trust, and everybody trusts something, everybody has faith in something. People will trust their wisdom. They will say to themselves, boy, I'm really smart. I can figure things out on my own. I don't need uh, a book to tell me what. I don't need a teacher. I don't need a God. I don't need anything. I can work this all out on my own. Because why? Because I'm going to trust in my wisdom. I'm going to trust in my reasoning. There are people who trust in their behaviors. They say, well, my behavior will produce certain things. Those things will be good things. They will be good for the world. And oh, 
Ultimately, they will be good for me. Their faith is in their behavior. And maybe when I get to see God one day, God will look at my behavior and he will say, well, you did a good job. Some people trust their attitudes. You know, I don't do real, I, or, or their, their intentions. I have good intentions. Yeah, I didn't help this person. Yeah, I didn't do that. And yeah, I was selfish. But I had good intentions. I tried to be good. I did my best. And God understands that when I stand before him one day, he will simply look at my, how good my intentions were, and my intentions will somehow secure for me eternal life. We trust in all kinds of things. We trust in the things of this world, we trust in our wealth, we trust in our wisdom, we trust in our success, we trust in our governments, we trust in all kinds of things to help us in our time of need. But the Apostle Paul here says there is only one thing that we can trust in, and that one thing is the Lord Jesus Christ. The faith that is being referred to here is not faith in faith or faith in other things. The faith that is being referred to here is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts uh, chapter 4, um, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given above men whereby we must be saved. There's only one thing that can save us. There's only one person that can save us, and that person deserves our trust and our dependency. Probably one of the greatest um, examples of this, I, I find, is in Luke chapter 23 when Jesus is dying on the cross. He's crucified between two thieves. And the one thief begins to mock Jesus and ridicule him, you know, like all the, all the crowd is doing. But the other thief is far more sympathetic to Jesus and, and who he claimed to be and what he claimed to do. And in Luke 23, the, the one thief finally says to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the very next verse, Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now that is an example of what faith looks like. A dying thief puts faith in the man who's right next to him, in the man who is dying, falsely accused. He understands something about Jesus. You know, he, he, he understands that Jesus is a king. He understands that Jesus was innocent, that Jesus shouldn't have been crucified. He understands certain things. He doesn't understand everything. He probably doesn't understand the doctrine of the Trinity. He probably doesn't understand covenant theology. He probably doesn't understand um, substitutionary atonement. But he understands that the person dying next to him can save him. And so he says to him, remember me, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I am going to remember you this very day. This very day you will be with me in paradise. Now, that's faith, you see. The, the thief isn't, isn't looking to his good works. Evidently, he doesn't have a lot of good works. He's a thief. The thief is not looking to his great religious education or his religious teaching or his great theology. He probably doesn't have a lot of it. He simply puts his faith and trust in the man who said, I am the resurrection and the life. I, you know, sometimes, you know, I always think about that question that D. James, I think it was G, D. James Kennedy came up with. You know, if you were to stand before God today, if you were to die and stand before God, God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What's the answer? You know, it's like there's this secret code in order to get into heaven. But there, here's my answer to the question. My answer to the question is, why should I get into heaven? Because Jesus invited me. And because I'm simply responding to his invitation. My faith is in Jesus. My trust is in the Lord Jesus, in what he said and what he did and what he promised. It's all in him. If it's, it's not in how good of a person I was. I wasn't that good of a person. It's, it's not in how successful I was. It's not in what I did or what I didn't. It, it's simply that Jesus invited me. I am responding to the invitation of the Lord Jesus. I am responding to his words. I am responding to his invitation. I am here because he said I could come. And that's what the thief is doing. The thief will stand before God and say, Jesus invited me. That's why I'm here. That's faith. Faith is taking Jesus at his word. 
trusting in him, looking only to him, depending only on him. And this faith, um, it says in our text, um, for by grace are you saved through faith, and this not of your own doing. That's the whole point, right? If, if, if I have faith in my works or I have faith in other things, then it's, it's part of my own doing. And this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one would boast. Yeah, I used the illustration last week of someone saying, you know, of a child saying, I helped. And, and I said, that's, that's not, nobody in heaven is going to say that. Nobody is gonna, in heaven is going to say, I helped to get myself here by my good works. I helped to get myself here by going to church. I helped to get myself here by praying a prayer this way. That's what got me here. Nobody's going to say that. They're going to say, I got here because of what Christ has done, because God sent him by his grace and by his power. That's how I am here. And interestingly enough, it says at the end of verse 8 that this faith is not of yourselves. Or it says, and this not of yourselves. Now notice in the English, if you, in the ESV, there's a period after faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, period. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now what Bible scholars debate at that particular point is, the, the word this, and this is not of your own doing. What does the this refer to? Does it refer, now typically in Greek, here's what, well, in, in anything, in English in, in the same way, in word order, typically the, this would refer to the thing that came before it, to the, to, the, to the idea or the object that came before it. And the object that came before it is faith. So is, is Paul saying, um, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this faith is not of your own doing. That's a possibility. Or is he saying, and this whole thing that God orchestrated, this whole plan of salvation is not of your own doing. That's more likely because of the language of the Greek, and there's a technical reason why that. But many people have said, no, he's really referring to faith. I think he's referring to the whole act of salvation. But get this, the whole act of God's salvation includes us having faith. In other words, no matter how you look at it, the this, either directly or indirectly, refers to faith. In other words, here's what I'm saying. If you have faith this morning in the Lord Jesus as the Savior of your soul, if you have faith, it is because this faith came to you from God as a gift. And there are many Bible verses we could look at to refer that. Um, there's a great one in Matthew chapter 16 where Peter confesses Jesus as the Son of God. Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, Peter's great confession is the result of Peter's wisdom, right? No. Peter's great confession is a result of his extensive study of the Hebrew scriptures. No. His faith is the result of the gift of God. Similar kind of thing in John chapter 3, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Unless you are both born of water and the Spirit, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there is, this, there is the working of the Spirit that needs to take place. There is the plan of the Father that needs to take place. Faith comes to us. Even faith is not a work. Even faith is a gift of God, which is odd when you stop and think about it, but if faith was a work, then we would be saved by works, you see, that's the problem. And he's just told us over and over that we're saved by grace, not by works, including the work of faith. The work of faith doesn't even save us. And yet the work of faith is necessary. It's extremely, I mean, without it, you will not be saved. Think of faith, I'd sometimes like to think of faith as an instrument. Um, if you think of, um, 
a musician. Uh, you know, a, mus a musician has music that he plays, and the music is ordered, it is designed, you know, somebody writes the music. The musician is a, obviously has interpretative themes, and the musician has skill and, and all that sort of thing. But between the music and the musician, there needs to be something in the middle. <laughs> there needs to be an instrument that he's playing. And the instrument in and of itself is really not, not much. I mean, a, a brass, it's either made of brass or it's made of wood in some form or another. But when you put the two together, when you put the music together, and the, when you put the musician together, and you intersect them with a musical instrument, all of a sudden you have something that's beautiful. The instrument is sort of the stagnant part of the equation, but, but in the hands of the musician, and in the hands of the music writer, the instrument all of a sudden begins to play this beautiful music. And so it is with our faith. Our faith in and of itself is not nothing, but in the hands of God, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, in the plan of God, our faith becomes the means by which the music of salvation can be played. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. You, and this, even this, is the gift of God. John Newton was on a ship in 1748. Now, he, he's about 20-ish years old, maybe a little bit. Um, no, he's over 20 at this particular, he's 23 at this particular point. And he's at the, the wheel of a ship, and the, the, there is a massive storm, and he's pretty convinced that the ship is going to fly apart, and everybody's going to perish because the storm is really bad. And when, you know, when sailors become afraid of storms, you know it's a bad storm. Newton had been reading a little bit of the Bible at this particular time and some other uh, religious works. And, and so in his fear and in his dread, he, begin, he cries out to God that night that God would save him from death, save him from the storm. And God does. Probably the first time in Newton's life that he put genuine faith in God. He, he, he genuinely prayed a prayer of, God, I am going to die. I need you. And he prays a prayer of great humility. Newton would mark that prayer for the rest of his life every day after, every year after that. On that particular day, he would devote himself to prayer, thanking God for the provision of saving his life on that particular day. And it was the beginning, it wasn't the end, it was the beginning of Newton's life of faith. He had moved from not trusting God, trusting in his own self, trusting in the things of this world, to beginning to trust <clears throat> in God because he'd taken a step of faith. He had acted in faith, in prayer, and in committing himself to God. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And then there's a third word that comes up in the text, in verse 10. And oftentimes we quote verses 8 and 9, but we somehow skip over verse 10. But verse 10 becomes actually pretty important in understanding the whole concept. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And it's almost like Paul sort of, he's talking about grace through faith, you know, he's talking about salvation, but then he throws in this things of works, and what's he talking? And, and it's almost like it's an afterthought, but it's, but it's not. See, salvation is not, how do I want to say this? Salvation is not through our works, but salvation is a work. It is the work of a gracious God. We are his workmanship. In other words, salvation is the work of God. And when God applies salvation to us through the power of his grace, through our faith, all of a sudden we become a different person. We become his workmanship. Workmanship there is sometimes, there was one translation that translates uh, workmanship as masterpiece. For we are his masterpiece. And that's actually the idea contained in the word a little bit. It, it, you could also translate it as we are his creation. We are, his, we are the thing that he puts special attention to. He, he designs in a special particular way. 
Salvation is God's recreation, as it were. We're created once physically, but now we're recreated spiritually. We're created into new people. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we are created in Christ Jesus. Jesus, incidentally, this is a play on creation because when you get to Colossians chapter one, for example, Jesus is considered to be the creative, he's not considered to be, he is declared the creative force of the universe. Everything that exists, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, that is Jesus. So Jesus is the creative power of the Trinity. The Trinity. He's, he's the creative means of the Trinity, the triune God. And now Jesus is the creative means by which we are recreated into new creations by the grace of God. We were sinners. We were rebellious against God, but all of a sudden we've been, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now we are created and given new life. And that new life results in good works. It results in new behavior. Salvation results in good works. And he says all along, this was the plan God prepared all along. This has always been the plan. That new creations would, would do new things and act in new ways, in new behavior. It's, it's ironic that works don't contribute to our salvation. Yet, if we are saved, we truly become new works and we live in new life. So much so that if you don't live in the new life, Jesus, even Jesus said, look, you will know a tree by its fruit. If you're not bearing the fruit of the new life, then guess what that probably means? It, it could very well mean you don't have new life. You have yet to be recreated by the power of God. That's how important works are. They're not important for our salvation, but they are the important outgrowth of what our salvation brings. The fruit is necessary. And the fruit is necessary if we're going to glorify God. Remember we looked last week <clears throat> how the whole purpose of God's salvation was to bring glory to himself. Well, how does he do that? in a visible, tangible way, because glory, glory is an ethereal, glory is visible. You can see glory, you can taste it, smell it, you can touch it at some level. Glory is, can be seen and can be evidenced. Well, how does God display his glory in your life in this world here and now? I know how he's gonna display it in heaven, I know a little bit, but how does he display his glory now? Well, he displays it when you become a new creation, when you begin to be a selfish, self-consumed, uh, self-righteous, uh, full of, you know, sinful person, and all of a sudden you become the opposite of that. God is glorified, and God's name is praised. Let your light shine before men, Jesus said, in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And the Apostle Paul says that's the result of our salvation. The result is good works in our lives. Are you living a new life today? John Newton would go on to survive the storm of 1748 and continue, interestingly enough, working in the slave trade for a number of years. He didn't see any contradiction between his job of, you know, carting slave, slavers, uh, uh, Africans back and forth. He saw that as a fine way to do business. But over time, he began to feel the opposite. And eventually, Newton would not only abandon the slave trade, he would go on to become a minister of the gospel. He went on to write 280 hymns, for example, and he became one of the key influential persons in the abolitionist movement in England. He met William Wilberforce in 1785, and the two of them, as well as the group that they had formed and were a part of, eventually saw the abolition of slavery in English in, in England. In, eight, in the spring of 1807, 
a, a law was passed outlawing the slave trade in England. In December of 1807, Newton would die. Amazingly, God had taken a slave trader and made him one of the key figures in the abolition of slavery. John Newton. That's the grace of God. The grace of God takes a man who sees nothing wrong with the slave trade and, trans and, and who doesn't like God to begin with. <laughs> That's who Newton was. He didn't think much of God. He takes a man who doesn't care much about God and he transforms him into one of the most influential figures in his day in, aboli in the abolition of slavery. He wrote numbers of pamphlets. He wrote numbers of books, hymns, did all kinds of things. God changed him for his glory. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Newton said this at the end of his life. He said, when I was young, I was sure of many things. Now there are only two things of which I am sure. One is that I am a miserable sinner and the other, that Christ is an all-sufficient Savior. He is well taught who learns these lessons. Are you in need of grace today? Not just the favor of God, but the power of God to redeem your soul and redeem your spirit? Then look to him in faith and begin to live a new life in obedience to this God. It is the only way you will find the peace and the joy and the contentment that you seek. By faith, through grace. Th by grace, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, may this grace become so real to us that our lives are transformed. May you be glorified, Lord, in all that you are doing in us and in our church and in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.